Okay, guys, so thanks for coming out this evening. As you know, our, our speaker this evening is Dadle Schlichter. He's had a, uh, we were delighted to welcome. He's had a 19 year career in international financial markets. Worked at JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, and Western Asset Management, among other companies. And he left the industry in 2009 to focus on his book, Paper Money Flaps, which is what I think he's going to be talking about this evening. So, welcome, Dadle, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, I'd like to present you this evening some of the key theses and the outlook that I developed in my book, uh, Paper Money Collapse. Since the book came out in September 2011, I uh, spoke about the book on a, on a couple of Occasions and some of my presentations are on YouTube or on, on my website. Um, I try to make each of these talks slightly different and I will try to do the same this evening. So I hope what I have to say is of some interest well, to those who you have not never heard about the book and uh, you know, have not read it, uh, but it's also hopefully of some interest to those who have heard me speak about it and may have even read the book. Paper Money Collapse, uh, the book, uh, presents what I hope is a coherent and logical economic argument. It argues the case. Um, it, it argues the case against the current you know, mainstream consensus, what I call the current mainstream consensus, certainly in financial markets and in the media, and I think to a large degree also in academia. That consensus maintains that uh, there uh, should be some, something like monetary policy. It is good to have such a thing as monetary policy. While most economists today um, readily accept that the market is a superior mechanism for allocating scarce resources and allocating those resources efficiently, when it comes to money, the current consensus maintains that money should be you know, controlled uh, by the state, that there should be something like a central bank, and that there should be something like monetary policy. Specifically, uh, monetary affairs should be organized in such a way that the money supply constantly expands so that uh, the purchasing power of money constantly declines at a specific, you know, officially sanctioned weight. Um, and that when the economy for any reason gets into difficulties or we experience a, a recession, that you know, more money should be injected into the economy, that the economy should be re-stimulated by lower interest rates and, and extra monetary expansion. That is sort of the the current consensus, and it is believed that such a system, which I call an elastic monetary system, um, is, uh, is a better way to guarantee monetary and economic stability. I argue that this consensus is wrong, that this, the assumptions are wrong. Such a monetary system, I argue, is inherently incompatible with free market capitalism. First of all, such a monetary system has not evolved uh, as a result of market forces. It's not the outcome of a market evolution, uh, but it's obviously the result of political decisions, as we can clearly see in the monetary system that we have today, the way it came about. It's not the result of market factors or the spontaneous interaction of the trading public. It is a political institution. But more importantly, I think it can be argued that the constant expansion of such, in such a monetary system, the constant monetary expansion, must destabilize the economy. Specifically, you know, monetary expansion goes through the banking system and the financial industry and the financial markets, where this uh, constant monetary expansion will lower interest rates. Interest rates in a free market economy are important market prices that coordinate savings and investment and uh, uh, coordinate the capital allocation in an economy. These processes are systematically distorted by constant on ongoing monetary expansion. And therefore, imbalances will uh, uh, accrue. Uh, we have misallocations of capital, which after some time leads to recessions. And in our monetary system now, you know, the elastic money system is being used to counter these recessions, as I said, with accelerated monetary expansion, which uh, does not allow the market to liquidate any imbalances from the previous expansion, but causes the system to accumulate dislocations and imbalances over time, and makes the system uh, progressively more unstable. So what I argue is that such a system is 
is what is first of all not needed, it's not necessary, and I will explain that in, in, in a few moments. What I mean by that is even a growing economy does not need a growing supply of money. So it's superfluous. But uh, more than that, it is inherently unstable. Uh, it will lead to imbalances, growing imbalances all the time. It's ultimately unsustainable. The monetary system we have today uh, will end, it will end badly, and probably even soon. Because the further point I make is that, uh, given the imbalances and distortions that have already accumulated, I argue that uh, the end game of this monetary system may already be fast approaching. I, uh, the, I mean, the first point you can make is here, or the first counterpoint is obviously that um, this seems to be a you know very bold statement, and you maybe you could even say an arrogant one because you know who am I to challenge you know, sort of this widespread consensus? Obviously, that that evidently many sort of very very smart people subscribe to. Well, I will argue in my book that I think. Some of the, the greatest minds of economic theory would actually support my case. I would argue that one of the key notions through the history of monetary economics, all the way from Richard Cantillon in the early 18th century to, um, I would argue, Ludwig von Mises in 1912 in his seminal book on money and credit, one of the persistent notions through the history of monetary economics was the idea that monetary expansion, the injection of new money into the economy, is a destabilizing factor. That has long been a topic. The British currency school, you know, David Ricardo, uh, there, there was a dominant theory there. And I would argue that the most sophisticated and most developed theory about this was developed by Ludwig von Mises in the, in the early part of the 20th century. So it's not something that I think is, is necessarily a, you know, a new insight, but one that seems to have been pushed aside rather than being um, uh, uh, Rejected um, uh, over the last sort of 60, 70, or 80 years. Well, if you look back 100 years ago, I would argue, in 1912, I would say that most economists, politicians, and bankers would have maintained that a global free market system, a global capitalism, requires a form of money that is hard, that is apolitical, and that's international. And that is why almost all industrialized nations subscribe to the gold standard. Money was hard, international, and apolitical. Today, obviously, we have money that is soft. It is certainly political, and it's now national because you know most countries uh, you know, control their central banks and have domestic, you know, local local currencies. Uh, one hundred years ago, in 1913, uh, one of the most powerful banks back then, you know, John Pierpont Morgan said, you know, gold is money and nothing else. It was one of his you know, statements. Um, and 80 years ago, almost to the day, in April of 1933, when President Roosevelt made you know, sort of the first uh, steps towards taking the US dollar off gold, he did this, interestingly, by endorsing what was the Thomas Amendment of the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which was a, a populist, part of monetary legislation that was slipped into the, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the Thomas Amendment. The Thomas Amendment for the first time allowed the US president to simply issue paper money or to, via discretionary decisions, change the gold content of the US dollar. So when it became clear that Roosevelt would endorse this, uh, his, his own budget director, Lewis William Douglas, said, you know, this is the end of Western civilization. Now, what I argue, in a way, is that Douglas was correct. Uh, now, it, it sounds like a grand statement, and you know, it's, it's 80 years ago, and, and, and civilization is still standing. But please remember that after the Second World War, uh, we had the Bretton Woods system, and which was designed to a large degree by John Maynard Keynes, who was no big fan of the gold standard. But even under Bretton Woods, a link to gold was maintained, and the objective here was clearly to provide some constraint to the creation you know, of, of fiat money, of paper money, and to not allow money to become a tool of politics. The Bretton Woods system practically ended on August 15, 1971, 
when Richard Nixon uh, again decided, rather unilaterally, to close the gold window and take the uh, dollar off gold internationally as well. So the current monetary system is really only 42 years old. Um, there were some constraints still in place until 1971. So if you look at 40 years or 80 years, you know, I don't think this is a very long time if you think about major economic deformations. And, uh, and I think the full consequences of these decisions are only more recently being felt to, 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 to their full. Uh, I'll give you another quote by Ludwig von Mises, who I mentioned earlier, who in a private correspondence in 1965 wrote, if our civilization will not in the next years or decades completely collapse, the gold standard will be restored. And again, I argue that sort of the importance that these people put on you know, a, a monetary constraint on time money in some shape or form to something that was not easily expandable, something that was fundamentally scarce and therefore limited the ability of states and equally of banks to expand the money supply, was believed to be a cornerstone of the free market system. And I do think that this was, you know, this was ultimately correct. So before I present sort of the, the, the key points of my book, uh, I maybe should address a few misconceptions that can quickly come up about the book and that I've been confronted with over the, over, over the, over the last two years that the book has been out. Where misconception one is sort of, well, you know, my book, I wrote my book to propose monetary reform. Uh, that is not really the case. I mean, if you talk about reform, it's, it's I think the idea is always that we suggest how we could run the monetary system better, and then it's all about convincing people that you know, we should make certain changes. Uh, and if the public does not pick up on these proposals, then the system will continue in its unreformed state. I don't think that that's really my message. My message is really clearly that this system is unstable, it's inherently unstable, and it is approaching its end game. So I do think that the system is unsustainable. And so I'm not proposing reform, I just want to hopefully engage my audience in, in, this, in this discussion about the unsustainability of the system. I'm not, I don't consider myself a monetary reformer. Certainly there are implications of what I have to say, and I do think at some stage we need to and we will return to a monetary system in which money, the money supply is more constrained. The misconception too is because of the title, Paper Money Collapse, some people think that the book predicts imminent hyperinflation. Now obviously we don't have hyperinflation right now and we may not have it anytime soon, so therefore you know, the prediction of the book is not coming true and we, as long as that doesn't happen, we can ignore this point of view. I think that's incorrect. I think, again, my key message is to show and discuss the inherent instability of the system. Hyperinflation is just one end game of the system, there are others. I think the number of end games is severely limited. Uh, there are only few end scenarios we can think of. Hyperinflation is one, I still do believe it's the most likely, but that is one we can discuss, but it's not necessarily uh, the only outcome. Um, I think another, and I will add one more thing here, because We've not seen a, a meaningful rise in inflation. We've certainly not seen hyperinflation in recent years. Um, the question comes up, has, have recent events made me more convinced about my outlook or less convinced about my outlook? I spent 20 years in financial markets and I can tell you if I look back through my career in finance, most of the major developments I've observed and I've been part of, I think fit my you know, description, my, my prediction of growing instability um, uh, very well. So I do think the events of the last well, 40 years, 20 years, certainly the events of recent years are leading up to and including the recent financial crisis, I think confirm my position or support it. But also the events, uh, the policy responses and the economic development since the book came out, so for, since September 2011, I feel have further you know, supported uh, my key thesis. Uh, there's another misconception maybe that the book is written by a market practitioner. As I said, I spent 20 years in financial markets. I left the financial industry to write the book. Uh, there could be the misconception that this is a book written by a practitioner, so it's all about sort of my view, my experiences in financial markets, uh, uh, a book that heavily focuses on recent events or the recent crisis. That is also not the case. I think if you read the book, uh, you see it's more written from the point of view of, of, of economic theory, 
as I said, I try to make a, a case, an arguable, a logically consistent case here. So it, I think it reads much more like an economics book, not a textbook, but uh, maybe a semi-academic book, uh, than, than uh, you know, the reflections of a market practitioner. There are no anecdotes in it. There are no personal market experiences in the book. Um, it, it is really sort of an, an economic case. Well, there's another misconception that maybe you know the book is just simply arguing a return to the gold standard. Again, I'm, I'm not seeing myself necessarily here as a, as a reformer or that there is no plan in the book of you know what, what we should do and how we could all change this. I do think the book rehabilitates the gold standard. Uh, I think it shows that uh, it was a mistake to take currencies off gold and to lose any kind of anchor. Uh, that the monetary system has practically become unhinged as a result of this, of these decisions, which were decisions that were not made, driven by economic theory or any advances in economic, monetary economics, but decisions that were always the result of sort of economic, uh, sort of political expediency. Um, so I, my book argues that these were mistakes, and that, that if we had stuck with the gold standard or some similar system, uh, you know, many of our present problems would not be with us. Um, but I don't necessarily argue for a return to the system that we had between 1879 or 1914 or 1933. Um, uh, I, I think we need to get back at some stage to a more inelastic for, uh, system. I think how that system is constructed and how it should work should be left to the market. And um, uh, I, I assume the market will again take something like gold as the basis for a monetary system. But that is a decision you know, I, I definitely don't want to uh, make. It's not the key point of, of, of my book. So let me summarize some of the key sort of messages uh, um, in the book and, and try to sort of hit on the, on the key points that hopefully support this thesis. Well, the first point I make is sort of if, if you think conceptually about monetary systems, we can divide them into roughly two sorts of monetary systems. Uh, and the important point here for me is the elasticity of the money supply. And that's why I call our current system an elastic monetary system. And the opposite of that is obviously an inelastic system. So we can think of about a system like a gold standard in which the supply of money is inherently inelastic. Where even in, under gold standard conditions, money is not entirely inelastic. First of all, you know, people can mine gold and get it into circulation. However, that is very costly and it takes time, and we all know that uh, even today with sort of modern mining techniques, the supply of gold, the outstanding volume of gold, uh, increases only very, very marginally every year. But for the sake of my argument, we can even ignore this completely. And uh, yeah, I would have no problem if mining stopped and we had a, a, an entire fixed supply of gold. Uh, well, secondly, obviously, over the last 300 years, your know, modern banking development, banks have always been fractional reserve banks, the banks have always been also in the business of issuing money derivatives, so bank notes and bank deposits that are not backed by gold, that did this even under gold standard conditions, that has always increased the supply of what the public uses money uh, beyond what was available in the form of gold, and introduced an element of elasticity into the money supply, uh, which was in fact the reason why economists, uh, uh, even 200 years ago, in investigated the effects of monetary elasticity. Uh, so there's another element of, of elasticity that, that we, we observed under the gold standard. But for, again, for the sake of the argument, let's ignore these points and let's look at an, in an entirely inelastic system, such as a proper, you know, 100% gold standard. And then there are elastic monetary systems like modern paper money systems, fiat money systems, in which the supply of money is entirely, you know, unrestrict, uh, unrestricted. Now, obviously, in a paper money system, not everybody is allowed to print money. Uh, printing money is always uh, the prerogative of the state, and that's why all paper money systems are fiat -like systems uh, in which uh, you know, money is being issued under the, under the state and under the state monopoly. I think the first point I make about elasticity is that most people struggle with the concept of inelastic money because most people think that a growing economy needs elastic money. A growing economy means we have more goods and services, so we have more transactions every year. Money is the medium of exchange. In order to transact more goods and services, we need more money. So and I think intuitively, most people feel that it, it makes sense to have constant monetary expansion. A growing economy needs more money. 
And this is a fundamental misunderstanding of money. Money is different from any other good or service because money is the only good that you demand only for its exchange value. Your money as itself has no use value. The, 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 whether you use gold or paper money or modern computer money, which is just bits on a computer hard drive, yet none of these things give you any direct use value. They only give you exchange value. Nobody who demands money has a demand for a certain number of paper notes or a certain weight of gold or silver. What you, you demand a certain quantity of these monetary assets because of the exchange value they give you, because of either the purchasing power. Now, if, you want, if the demand for money changes, you can just allow the market to adjust the exchange value of the monetary asset, and that will automatically meet the extra demand for money. So let's assume we have a community where most people suddenly have a higher demand for money. What that means is people want to hold more of their wealth in its most readily tradable form, in its most readily uh, um, uh, exchangeable form, and that is money. Money is always the most fungible good in the economy, the one that can most readily and easily be exchanged for goods and services. So the demand for purchasing power in the form of money goes up. So what would people do? People will sell non-money goods for the money good, for, for whatever the money good is, or they will reduce their money outlays for non-money goods, and that way try to accumulate higher money balances. But if more people do this, it obviously means that prices go down, and the opposite of that, the flip side of that, is that the purchasing power of the monetary asset goes up. Well, we could call that deflation. And, and the other way, if, if uh, the demand for money goes down, people will spend money, try to get rid of the money balances, and uh, the prices will go up and the purchasing power of money goes down. But let's go back to the first case. The demand for money goes up. So people want to hold more of their wealth in the form of money. They have built up the purchasing power of money. And by, uh, simply by this act, the market automatically will satisfy the extra demand for money. Because now there is no, there is no more physical money in the economy. There are no more paper notes in the economy. And there are no more, no more gold coins in the economy. But each of these units now buy more goods and services. So people hold now more exchange value in the form of money, and that is exactly what money demand means. You, you only demand money for its exchange value, not for its use value. So the, the peculiar thing about money is that it's the most fungible good of the economy, and the only one you only demand for is this exchange value. That is why any change in money demand can be automatically satisfied by simply allowing the market to adjust the exchange value of money. And this happens automatically by people transacting, buying and selling money versus non-money goods according to their own money demand. The public is in full control here. The public can hold at any moment in time exactly the amount of money in terms of money exchange value, money purchasing power, that it wants to hold. So that's the first one. There is no need for a money producer. Even in a growing economy, there is no need for somebody to constantly produce money. It should not surprise us because for most of human history, money was gold or silver, and for most of these economies, at least in the short run, uh, nobody could easily supply extra gold or silver. So therefore, uh, it should not surprise us that conceptually, you know, we can explain why inelastic forms of money are perfectly compatible with growing and dynamic economies. Now, I think the immediate response from mainstream economists will be, well, that must mean that we have constant swings in the purchasing power of money. You know, that, that must mean that uh, uh, if, if the demand for money goes up, we have deflation. If the demand for money goes down, we have inflation. So that, that in itself must introduce instability. And uh, that, that is not really the, 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 the case. And we can again see this conceptually. If a certain part of the population suddenly feels they want to have, they have a higher demand for money, they want to hold more of their wealth in form of money, uh, uh, in, in ready to exercise their purchasing power. So these people bid up the purchasing power of the monetary unit. But the other group of people in the economy, who we have to assume have not changed their demand for money, they have the same demand for money as they had before. But suddenly, whatever money balances they hold, these money balances suddenly buy more goods and services. So the opportunity cost of holding money goes up. I could rather spend the money. I, I don't want, I don't, you know, a, a smaller money balance will now meet my unchanged demand for money. So these people will readily spend the money and therefore hand it over to the people who have a higher money demand. I'm not saying, and nobody can say, that this will always mean a stable purchasing power of money. In fact, 
the idea of a state of purchasing power among is a myth, you know, because in a dynamic economy, it will never be entirely stable. And, and there is now a bit of an obsession with, with purchasing power stability. But we can see from this conceptual analysis that there is no reason to believe that it will be unduly volatile, that we have big swings in the purchase of power. And again, this is something that we can confirm very easily by just looking into history. I mean, through the long periods of time when money was gold or silver and it supplied fairly inelastic, not only did it stop economies from growing and from, from trade expanding, um, we also see that there, that there was no major inflation or deflation in these economies. In fact, you know, for most of the time, the purchasing power money was, was incredibly stable. Over well, long history, the periods of, of British history, is fairly nicely documented how stable prices were. In fact, economists only really began to investigate inflation and deflation as monetary phenomena that would destabilize the economy in those periods and when the, the, the link between money and gold or silver was set. You know, for example, in uh, between uh, 1797 and 1821, when you know, William Pitt took the pound sterling of gold to fund the war against France, that's when we had the bullion debate in, in, in Britain, and some of the economists discussed this new phenomenon of inflation. So, again, it will not be, it, it, we don't need elastic money. Elastic money can accommodate a growing economy. It does not lead to undue fluctuations in the purchase of power of money. There's a, one other objection that will come at this point usually, which is, well, over longer periods of time, it must mean deflation. Because if the economy grows and provides more goods and services, but there is the same amount of money needs to accommodate now growing the number of transactions, that means that there will be a trend for the purchase of power of money to go up. There will be secular deflation. And again, this is absolutely no problem. If it happens, that's, that's absolutely uh, no reason to believe that this will lead to economic instability. Well, first of all, think about it this way. The, the advocates of our current monetary system suggest that it would be better to have 2% inflation. But why would it be better for economic actors if, in, if, if they knew or could reasonably expect inflation uh, prices to go up by 2% every year? And in a deflation environment, they can expect prices to go down by 1 or 2%. They will incorporate the, this in their contracts, in their loan contracts, and in, in, in their lending and borrowing, just the same way that people anticipate inflation today. So if you can have a stable economy, as the advocates of our, of our current system tell us, if inflation constantly is 2%, what's the problem with 2% deflation? Now, here again, I think. This is one of the things that, that gets me often aggravated because if you read the, 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 uh, some of the financial press, there is often this talk about you know, Japan being in deflation and, and that holds the economy back because nobody's spending money anymore because I, I know that prices go down so I, 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 I postpone all my consumption decisions because prices are lower tomorrow if, if I don't spend my money now and then I don't spend it tomorrow either because tomorrow I will know that it's even lower the next day so I never spend the money. Which is obviously nonsense. And, and we all can see this. I mean, what this view completely ignores is the, the phenomenon of time preference, which is something that uh, we all experience. If we, if we didn't experience it, then we wouldn't act. It's, it's an in, in, inherent factor of human action, this time preference. Uh, and you can see that this very clearly in, in, in those goods and uh, services, in particular those goods, uh, where prices have been declining and will probably continue to decline. Uh, even in our inflationary economies, you know, things like smartphones, laptops, a lot of uh, you know, consumer electronic items, prices are falling, but people still buy the latest BlackBerry or you know, iPhone. Uh, and the reason is, we can clearly explain this, this very easily, it is time preference. You know, it's not the same for me to, whether I have a new phone today or in five years' time. It's, it's, it's not, and, and in five years' time it may be 4% you know, cheaper, but I think the pain of waiting for four years is just greater. And, and this is the same with, with, uh, with, with other economic goods. By the way, I add one more thing to this, is you know, Japan does not really have deflation because prices have not hardly changed over the last 10 years. So by any reasonable measure, I would argue that Japan has to precise deflation. Um, there's no reason to believe that that is the reason uh, the economy is growing poorly. And in fact, there have been lots of historic studies about you know, economies, the US economy and the British economy in the 19th century, long stretches of falling prices, and those were not a hindrance to growth. So, 
So we have all, we, we, we covered all these points, I think, that so the uh, inelastic money can accommodate a growing economy, does not need to have big swings in the price level, and it may lead over time to moderate secular deflation, which is not a problem. Indeed, I argue in the book it has many advantages, uh, secular deflation, one of them being that uh, you can save by only money, um, uh, which uh, would give you a small real return. Um, so there are even advantages for, for having a deflationary system uh, rather than an inflationary one. But the key point here is that even if we had the monetary producer, if we, if we have now an elastic monetary system and we would charge the uh, money producer with the goal of stabilizing the purchasing power of money, not to allow the deflation, the secular deflation, but more importantly, to even counter any changes, any sudden changes in money demand. Because as I explained before, if there is a major sudden change in money demand, if for suddenly people want to hold more money uh, or less money, that must reflect, be reflected in the purchasing power of money that will lead to money prices you know, either falling or rising. And I agree that this phenomenon in itself can have destabilizing effects on the economy. So, but what if we have a now money producer who is charged with the, uh, the job of, of countering these moves? Well, the first point I make is, you know, it's completely impossible for anybody to stabilize the purchasing power of money. Because remember, the moment people have a higher demand for money, they will immediately stop, reduce their money outlays on non-money goods, or even sell non-money goods into the market and try to acquire higher uh, cash balances. What I mean is, people will immediately act on that changed uh, desire to hold money. And when the prices then change, and we have a period of deflation, let's say, in response to higher money demand, that deflation is in itself sufficient to completely meet that rise in money demand. Again, remember, money has on exchange value no use value. If the public demands has a higher demand for cars or for mobile phones, somebody has to produce more cars or mobile phones because these are things have use value. Money has exchange value. The rise in money's purchasing power, the price change of money, is fully sufficient to meet the rise in demand in money for money. So therefore, let's look at our money producer now. So he suddenly is confronted with falling prices, which tell him quite clearly that the demand for money has gone up. But first of all, it's now too late to avoid this effect. If he wanted to stabilize the purchasing power of money, it's already too late, because it already has happened. The deflation has already occurred. So it, it, his, his mission of, of keeping the purchasing power stable he has already failed. And now there is no point for him to print extra money to meet the extra money demand because people have already satisfied that extra demand for money by simply allowing money prices to fall and the purchasing power of the monetary unit to rise. So, again, I think uh, the, the, some of the key notions that I think hinder many people to see the advantages uh, with, uh, of inelastic money, or you know, some people see problems with inelastic money that I think clearly do not exist. I think on the other hand though, and this is I think probably even a more important part now, we can show that elastic forms of money must destabilize the economy. Again, I mentioned earlier that the uh, that the uh, this is a long-standing idea or suspicion of economists, and many economists have, have, have looked at this, is that the sudden expansion of money will um, will lead to economic dislocations. And uh, what I do in the book is I, I start with a very simple model of an economy where suddenly at some point you inject money into the economy. And uh, uh, it's, it's very clear that in any kind of realistic model of, of, a, of an economy, money cannot be injected in such a way that the money instantly reaches everybody in the economy at the same time. So you always have to inject money at a certain point and then allow the transactions to occur that will distribute the extra money balances. And obviously we all know since, as I said before, Richard Cantillon, who wrote in, in the early 18th century, that we, when we have such a monetary expansion, and therefore an inflation, uh, that not all prices respond at the same time, and not all prices respond to the same degree. And this is 
the result of the process I just described. The money is not reaching everybody instantaneously. The money is going from one point in the economy to other points and, and, and it's being distributed. Uh, so not all prices will rise at the same time and to the same degree, which always means that at the end of the mon monetary expansion process, you will have changed relative prices. And if you change relative prices, you will have changed the, the, the way resources are allocated. So definitely you will have changed the employment and the use of, re of real resources. You will have certainly affected income distribution and wealth distribution. Any monetary expansion creates winners and losers. And at a, at a, in a very simple model, you can show that the beneficiaries of monetary expansion are always the, the early recipients. The people who get the money first, before it has been, began to circulate through the entire economy, are the ones who can spend the money that, that they get first from the money producer before it has lost its purchasing power, before you know, a lot of prices in the economy have responded to this inflow of money. And uh, so therefore, as I said, it always changes, resource, it changes relative prices, it changes resource allocation and resource use. So it, it also changes what the economy produces. I think today one of the problems with these discussions that you see in the media is often that there is this perception that we, we inject money into the economy that will stimulate the economy and will, on the margin, lead to somewhat higher prices. But the, the idea is always that we all benefit from the extra growth and uh, that we all have the disadvantage of the loss of purchasing power. And that is not the case. Actually, the, 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 the earlier recipients will probably benefit much more from the extra growth that the, from the extra transactions that are not possible with the extra money or that be instigated by the extra money before the money lost the purchasing power. There will be some people and some parts of the economy that will get the money much later and they will probably only suffer the inflationary effects of the money and not benefit from the extra transactions at all. So uh, the, the idea that this would, this would just lift all those simultaneously is, uh, is, is one that can be easily be refuted. But obviously in a modern economy, all monetary expansion occurs via the uh, financial system. Uh, so uh, the point in the economy where the, the extra money comes in is always the banking system. I mean, the, and, and I mentioned fractional reserve banking earlier, that is for the last 300 years that has been the most elegant way. Of, and, and, and the only way really by which you can get large amounts of new money into the economy is via the banking system and via the financial system. So that is the point now where the money enters the economy. And not surprisingly, that's where the people are located that are the largest beneficiaries of monetary expansion. Now, but, uh, what, what this money does, it will obviously now have an effect on interest rates. As I mentioned before, interest rates are important market prices. Indeed, interest rates are relative prices. The price, relation, uh, price ratios that are an important factor in communicating the public's time preference to the various producers in the economy. So, by coordinating saving and investment. If we can uh, envision a process by which interest rates fall and extra investment is stimulated, and that process being initiated by a growing propensity to save. So, let's assume people save more. Uh, they curtail consumption, that, that means they're shifting resources from current consumption into investment and savings, so they save these resources, they make them available on the loan market. The extra funds that become available on the loan market with lower interest rates, at lower interest rates, more investment projects become profitable, entrepreneurs will take on the extra loans on the, on the credit market, <coughs> the capital market, and realize extra investment projects, and they use obviously real resources for doing this, and these are the resources that the savers, that the consumers slash savers have saved by their decision to, to save. And, and this is really sort of in a nutshell sort of the economic growth model of a capitalist economy. You know, out of real income, you have real savings, which is foregone consumption, and that funds the capital stock which allows higher productivity, which allows higher real incomes, and therefore allows them higher real savings. You can expand the capital stock, and that's one way by which the economy gets richer and wealthier. A similar process happens if you inject new money into the economy, where now nobody has saved, nobody has cut out present consumption, nobody has made a decision that resources should be allocated from present day consumption to future consumption, which is saving, 
but for the entrepreneurs who look at the capital markets, it looks the same. Interest rates are falling and extra funds are available. Now, these are not safe funds. These are not this is printed money. But the entrepreneurs cannot really distinguish. And how could they? So they will again start investment projects and obviously use the extra money to realize the investment projects. But in order to realize investment projects, they need real resources, which they try to bid away from the consumers, which don't want to give them up because they want to consume them. They, they've never decided to save. And therefore, never decided to make real resources available for you know, a bill of a, of a real capital stock. So what I just explained is, is in a nutshell, in a very simplified form, what has become known as the Austrian business cycle theory. Now, it's, it, Ludwig von Mises really is the reason we call it the Austrian business cycle theory. Ludwig von Mises, who first elaborated this in, 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 in his 1912 book, Theory, theory of uh, Money and Credit, he didn't really want to call it the Austrian business cycle theory because he knew that he was building on work by the British classical economists who already worked on similar ideas in the 19th century. But uh, uh, Mises wanted to apply the new marginalist theories that had come up in the late 19th century, in particular the ideas of Karl Menger, a fellow Austrian, uh, and uh, wanted to incorporate those into monetary theory. And in doing so, in, in, in uh, using marginal subjective economic theory, which was very new in the early part of the 20th century, used that to explain monetary phenomena, he practically formulated a superior business cycle theory, and that was then called the Austrian business cycle theory. Now, uh, when the, it's called a business cycle theory, but I don't think that's really a good description any longer for what we have today. Because remember, when Mises formulated this theory, and, or even the British classical economists, we had a goal set. So uh, the monetary expansion that these economists looked at, that these economists looked at, was a very different kind of monetary expansion than what we have today. What it basically was is money proper was gold, as J.P. Morgan said. Gold is money and nothing else. But banks managed to issue bank deposits and bank notes on top of the gold stock, and thereby expand by, by simply lowering their reserve ratios, they could expand the money supply. And, and this was, uh, and the, the theory basically said that this kind of marginal elasticity is a good explanation, or is the best explanation, I would argue, for the business cycle phenomena that we that people saw even under gold standard conditions. But as long as there was a gold anchor, there was, in a way, a self-correcting mechanism here, because obviously the banks, when they expand the balance sheet and create these money derivatives, there is a point in which uh, their reserve ratios become too low, and they uh, uh, they curtail their lending again in the money creation. Uh, that usually then starts a recession, and in the recession, a lot of these uh, investment projects that were started or based on, on easy money and not based on saving were then liquidated in the following recession. So you had a, had a money-induced credit boom and then a credit bust and a correction. Uh, so, so this was a, a, you know a business cycle theory, but you had two parts of the cycle, the boom and the bust. Now what we have since we've done away with the gold anchor and now moved to a system of complete you know, fiat money and entirely uh, unrestricted money creation is that now we try to short circuit the bust. So the system, the way it's designed now, still allows for the boom. So that, you know, banks expand lending based on money creation. Uh, banks lower reserve ratio, the small credit gets extended for money creation. That leads to a boom. Uh, it's still a phenomenon we see today. But for the last 40 years, whenever the cycle turns and you get to a point where banks become more concerned about their balance sheet or their capital ratios, cut back on the lending, and the economy rolls over and goes into recession, we now have the central banks, who are now lenders of last resort, and increasingly in the business of managing the economy, they come forward now and can print extra bank reserves lower interest rates administratively, which is, again, a new role that did not have really under gold standard conditions, lower interest rates, print more bank reserves. Bank reserves are no longer gold. Bank reserves, are, it's just electronic money that the central bank can create at will and without limit. So whenever the economy now goes into the bus, you don't get the cleansing recession, or you only get a little bit of it, and then we add more money to the system and allow the, the cycle to continue. Now what this means is that if the Austrians are correct, and I think they are, it necessarily means that now these imbalances must accumulate over time. 
And it must mean that the economy becomes increasingly unstable and, and increasingly in need of some sort of cleansing, some kind of recession that will allow the market to liquidate these accumulated imbalances. And uh, in fact, what we've seen, I think, very clearly over the last 20 years in particular, is that the, monetary, the, the entire economy globally has become ever more dependent on cheap money, on, on, on very aggressive expansion of bank reserves and uh, very, very low interest rates. In fact, any attempt over the last 20 years by any of the central banks to kind of normalize interest rates, to go back to interest rate levels that were historically more normal, I mean, even to 4 or 5% as the Fed tried uh, you know, back in 2005, not only do we see a recession, we almost see immediately a financial uh, a crisis because the system is now so level because it will never, it's never really, it's never really been allowed over in recent decades to completely liquidate and, and, and go back into some form of balance. So I think that this is a view that clearly comes from the also business cycle theory, but adapts it to our current monetary system, which you do not have the gold as an anchor that pulls the system back to some kind of balance. Now, obviously, the recessions are painful, and, and people like me have always said, like, well, if you do want to avoid the recession, you have to avoid the artificial boom, right? I mean, you should not have, you should not try to encourage growth and, by artificially lowering interest rates. If interest rates are low because people save, that's fine. But if interest rates are low because you're simply printing money and encourage banks to lower their reserve ratios and create money out of thin air, you will get a boom bust cycle. You will not get lasting growth and prosperity. Uh, so it, it, obviously that did not make the Austrians very popular whenever there was a recession because nobody cared how we got in there. People just wanted to get out of it. And, and this is why I think that in our modern system today, uh, I think we have compounded these problems much further. Uh, now, at this point, I, I, I will maybe say a few words about my own experience here, just, as, just to, to close my remarks and then we can discuss this. But before I do this, uh, let me just give you one quote, which I think is essential in a quote, I use this quote twice in my book. In 1949, Ruby Bunmises Mises explained it such. He said, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as the, as the result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion, or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. And that is in a way the situation we're in right now and, and the situation we, we, we've maneuvered ourselves into. Uh, because over the last 20 years in particular, I argue, global, central banks globally have always tried to avoid these recessions and these li periods of liquidation and credit contraction. You know, to allow a meaningful deleveraging of the financial system was stopped whenever there were the early signs that this could happen. But as we do this, obviously, the imbalances become ever larger, the system becomes ever more highly geared and highly leveled, and we can see this in many, many indicators. So now we're probably at a point where none of the central bankers even dares to not provide more money to the system. And this is the reason why now we are in a situation where, you know, around the world, all the major central banks are now practically at zero interest rates, and all the major central banks are now using their own balance sheet to prop up the system. Uh, a few words about my, my, my own background here, my, my own experience in this. Uh, Obviously, you will have two more minutes. Yeah, I want to say. Now, the, this is the Oxford Hayek Society, so I should say a few words about Hayek. Now, you, you will see from my talk and, and from my book in particular that I think I, I owe my personal largest intellectual debt to Ludwig von Mises, who I think was the outstanding economist of the 20th century. Um, but Hayek worked with Mises and was, in a way, a prodigy of Mises uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, he, was, uh, he was about 17, 18 years younger than Mises. Um, uh, Hayek was sort of my introduction into sort of Austrian school economics. I, I, I studied economics in Germany, and uh, so studied economics and business, and uh, 
became very interested in these things, but I remember towards the end of my studies, we read some texts by Hayek, and it, that sort of really ignited my interest in, in, well, in economic theory, really, and also in political philosophy, and uh, certainly in the Austrian School of Economics. And I, I read sort of Austrian, first of all, I read probably everything that Hayek ever, ever wrote. I, I started a career in finance in 1990, so I, I never went into academia, I went into finance, and I worked in Frankfurt first, and then later in London. And I remember when I came to London in 1996, I, I even contemplated for some time buying Hayek's old house. We, you know, he used to live in the 1930s at H. Turner Close in Hampstead Garden suburb. And interesting, that house came on the market in the mid-1990s. I did not buy it. But uh, so for a long time, I was I considered myself a Hayekian. And I, I read everything he wrote, and then I read sort of, obviously, Mises, Rothbard, and some of the other writers, uh, Karl Mengler, Böhm, Bartek. Uh, now for, uh, uh, and, and again, I think, I think probably today I would have to call myself Misesian. I think that uh, Mises is somewhat different in, 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 theory, in some of his methodology and some of his, his, his theories from some of the other Austrian writers, and I think that he's probably the most consistent and most impressive. But throughout all these years, that was a hobby of mine, I used to work in financial markets, but it was very interesting that I think from, from the late 1990s, it was in, clearly evident that the system was getting increasingly unstable. And I remember some of the key moments that, 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 you know, from those days. I remember in 1998, uh, and by the time it was probably already yeah, deeply steeped in Austrian school, so I understood the whole business cycle thing. And uh, in, in, in 1996, Alan Greenspan, then the chairman of the US Fed, had given a speech that is famous to this day. He gave a speech where he said, where he was first talking about irrational exuberance. So he was basically giving him that he felt financial markets were overly uh, optimistic, and we had a massive bull market in, in equities, not least in, in uh, technology stocks, and he felt that this was all going too far. Uh, and then, uh, so then in 1998, obviously the bubble had to burst, and the, uh, the trigger was the fall of Russia in August 1998, and shortly after that, a major hedge fund, a long-term capital management, LTCM, uh, got into trouble and uh, faced you know, default. And uh, at, the, at the time, so suddenly, you know, a lot of the markets shut down, big sell-off in risk assets, and we all were affected by this, obviously. But I felt that, you know, Greenspan would not lower interest rates in this environment, because clearly he even had a tightening bias, he even was leaning towards tightening monetary conditions. And, uh, but the moment the hedge fund went under, and some of the big Wall Street firms got, got affected by this, uh, he lowered interest rates a couple of times, and basically provided excellent liquidity to the system. And obviously, the liquidation of position that could have started then, uh, you know, he aborted. And I remember this well because I felt at the time, it's like, this, he cannot, I mean, if he does this, he's sending the wrong message here to everybody, because it's very clear that, uh, you know, even a, even a year or two years earlier, he was talking about the market getting ahead of itself and being, becoming too optimistic. He must clearly realize that maybe at some stage the market needs to liquidate. The market needs to correct. You know, sometimes these corrections are healthy. And he did not do this. And uh, so obviously then market rallied again. The next point where market, people were concerned about uh, this whole bull market ending was then at the end of 1999 because we had back then the Y2K phenomenon where people were concerned that all computers would shut down because we changed from 1999 to 2000. And I kid you not, the Fed did provide extra liquidity for that as well. So uh, within a very short period of time, the NASDAQ moved up the US stock index by another 40%. And obviously this all then ended in an even bigger burst in, in 2001 and 2002. 2001, the US had a recession. Obviously, at the 9/11 attacks, uh, the terrorist attacks, and in 2002, it experienced the two largest corporate bankruptcies in history, which was uh, WorldCom and which the other uh, Enron. 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 Sorry, of course, Enron and WorldCom. Tiger and Bust as well, and uh, uh, and now obviously the system was even more geared, but now we. The, 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 the Fed could not get away with just cutting interest rates again sort of a few times uh, in between meetings, which it did after LTCM. So now the Fed kept interest rates at 1% for three years. And obviously that was at the start of the main uh, housing bubble. You know, it's, it, it, it was very clear that from 2002 up to 2007, the Fed was, with its you know, easy monetary policy that sort of supported the system, 
uh, uh, blowing a massive housing bomb, which then burst in 2007. So now, 1% interest rates are not enough anymore. So now for the last five years, we had zero interest rates. And not only in the US, we have that policy in Japan, we have it practically in the Eurozone now, and we have, it, we have had it for the last five years in the UK. All these central banks are now at zero interest rates, all these central banks are now engaged in some shape or form quantitative easing. And my view is that none of these central banks is even close to reversing any of these strategies. I mean, right now the talk is of implementing negative, real interest, uh, negative interest rates at the front and negative policy rates. Uh, to force your sort of more money into the economy, and uh, and I think we will see that. I, I think I think we'll see more quantitative easing. We will see negative interest rates uh, because I think that the central banks have now painted themselves into a corner. They do not dare to pull the rug from under an ever more highly geared financial system. Um, so coming back and closing with the Mises quote, I think that is the choice we face. And these are basically the two end games I can see. Either at some stage. A decision is being made to stop money printing and allow the market to price interest rates according to truly available savings and, uh, and, and price assets according to their underlying uh, income potential and no longer according to central bank policy or you know, artificially low interest rates and super easy money. If that is that root is taken, we will obviously then finally get the liquidation, the full liquidation of these imbalances, which will be very painful. Uh, extremely painful, um, uh, or that is sort of the voluntary abandonment, as, uh, as Mises calls it, or we will not see this policy, but then central banks need to be ever more aggressive, they need to manipulate ever more prices, as we see already, central banks are now, the latest development is that central banks now start buying equities, and they're not only buying your short government bonds as they used to do now, they buy the entire yield curve, uh, they buy, uh, in some countries now, they buy practically all new issues of the state, in terms of government securities, and some of the central banks are now starting to buy equities. Uh, so the central banks ultimately will get in a position where they need to buy ever more financial assets and manipulate the price of ever more financial assets directly. Uh, and at some stage, this must lead, and will lead, I think, to higher inflation that will at some point undermine the confidence in paper money. And then we see the scenario that Mises calls the total, uh, the final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. That was the reason why I called the book Paper Money Collapse. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for, for an excellent talk, Adela. I'm sure we'll have some questions, so I'll, I'll let you choose the question. Is. Nobody has ever done this, and nobody ever 
has extracted themselves from such a policy position. You know, a balance sheet, now the Fed has a balance sheet of about three trillion US dollars. Um, uh, some of these balance sheets are now up to 20, 30% of GDP. Uh, so uh, I do think some of them are getting, getting nervous. I mean, some are still true believers. Some think that this will ultimately fix it. Some I think are getting nervous. And I think there is one, uh, there must be some, I believe, who would now basically just do this as an ad hoc basis because they have no choice. They feel like, you know, we cannot, what can we do? We, 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 don't, we don't want to have a bank run, we don't have an equity market collapse. And, and just, you know, uh, I think some of them must must be getting nervous. I mean, I, I know I would if I was in their shoes. So I have uh, two points and one question. Um, I'm not an, uh, not an economist, I'm a sociologist, but on the issue of uh, this argument that if there's a slight deflation, consumers will constantly postpone consumption and, or purchases, and therefore the economy uh, won't get off its feet. Does, there seems to be an obvious objection to that, but perhaps it's been refuted, that if there's inflation, sellers will not want to sell because they can <laughs> postpone uh, selling and get higher prices for it the next day. Uh, so I don't know why there's that, asymm yeah. that asymmetry hasn't been addressed, or perhaps it has. In the second place, uh, when you spoke about the issue of the possibility for slight instability, perhaps, under a uh, hard monetary system, at the expense potentially of huge swings caused by these build-ups of um, uh, uh, and assets that need to be liquidated. That reminds me of uh, Nassim, Nassim Taleb's arguments she's been making in the last few years, in particular that the uh, that you don't want to eliminate all volatility from the system because of these kind of self-correcting processes that volatility at a low amount introduces. Therefore, a low amount of volatility would seem to be an uh, advantage rather than something to be completely eliminated. Uh, so, if you could comment on that, and in the third place, what do you say to the suggestion that gold is just as arbitrary as paper? Yeah, very good points. I, I think, uh, hopefully, I, may take, I, I fully agree with you that the notion that a hard money system with secular deflation, that secular deflation will lead to everybody constantly postponing consumption decisions. I think that's nonsense. So I agree with you, and I think it's a very good point. Uh, I don't think it has really been fully addressed. It's a very good point that you know the same is true obviously on the other side of sales, and, and, and inflation would immediately stop selling and, and try to respond to sales. So it's a very good point. Uh, now I think I think it's 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 something that is uh, if just to add to this, the point I made about time preference is key here because so even if you know that a good you desire. Well, it, it, one economist put it very succinctly, he said, to want something means, if all else is equal, to want something means wanting it sooner rather than later. That's always the case. Yeah, and you can see this logically. If I, if I were to say that I'm, uh, whether I drive this car or not, whether I drive it today or tomorrow, I'm indifferent to this. Yeah, so, and that means tomorrow, I don't care if I drive it tomorrow or the next day, which means I would be okay if I never drive it. Which is very clear that I don't really consider driving the car good. You know, I don't care about driving the car, which is another way. But if you want something, you want it sooner rather than later. And then you always have, the only thing that people would have to do is then they consider that time preference with the saving that they get from falling prices. But something similar would actually happen, or does happen in our economy, as long as you have real positive interest rates. Because if, as, if I have positive real interest rates, it means I can save and earn an extra interest income. And that will also allow me to consume more, you know, the next year. So even without deflation, you can see in, in economies you often have these situations. It, there's nothing unusual, and it's not, a, a, not an economic problem. So I think I think that's a very good point. Uh, and Nasser Taleb is a very interesting uh, writer, and uh, I think there's something to be said for the, uh, you, the the instability. I mean, I think in general, looking at monetary systems. It's impossible to have a monetary system or create a monetary system that allows complete economic stability. And the reason is simply that is even if you look at the inelastic system, like a proper gold standard, where the money supply is fixed, uh, you cannot exclude that there are periods where suddenly, for whatever reason, the demand for money would change, and suddenly people want to hold more money, and we would have drop in prices. Now that drop in prices will actually cause 
that, that sudden deflation will cause some of the effects that I just described and attributed to money expansion. For example, it will be, it will affect people differently. You know, people who hold more money will be differently affected than people who hold less money. So it will also create winners and losers. So it, it, it will create also a certain kind of instability. So what the bottom line is, is the notion of neutral money is impossible. Money will never just be you know, veiled that's over the economy and does not interfere with real economic processes. That's impossible. But so the only thing we can argue here is that what is the system that is least disruptive for the economy? And there I would argue, and again, hopefully in line with many eminent economists, that, that an inelastic system is superior. I, I think my main uh, argument with the mainstream today and with what we hear every day in the media and what's being discussed in financial markets is that people now see it almost the other way. You know, it's, the elasticity gives us stability, and that is a misconception in my view. So I agree with Talib at that point. Uh, gold, of course, gold is just another, it's just another uh, thing. I mean, the, 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 why is it gold? I think it's an historic. I mean, money is a social convention, is a social tool for economic interaction. It so happened to be money. Uh, could it be something else? Yes, but if it's if it's a physical commodity, uh, you would have to say that gold, of all the 92 naturally occurring elements in the universe that we know of, gold is really ideally positioned for it because it's it's uh, it's per almost perfectly divisible. It's homogeneous. It's easily accessible. It doesn't decay. All the money that all the gold that was ever mined is still around and, and available. So it has many, many advantages, uh, and this is the reason why, for the last two thousand years, most economies have ultimately drifted towards gold. But could we imagine a new form of money? Yes, we could. And one of the interesting developments, I think, recently, it's just an experiment, but it's very interesting, is the solidity of Bitcoin. I don't know if you yeah. heard of it, but it's because it, it, what's interesting about well, Bitcoin is electronic money, so it's immaterial. Uh, it's uh, if, if it really is money, but it's, it's a cryptographic commodity. So it's, it's designed by cryptographers. It's based on an open source uh, uh, algorithm, so everybody can see the algorithm. Uh, but the interesting thing about Bitcoin is that the amount of Bitcoin that can be created according to this algorithm is strictly limited. You, know, uh, you can create them by running mathematical you know, puzzles on, on high-powered computers. You can, can mine these Bitcoins. It's called mining. And uh, get them into circulation, but uh, the uh, the way the algorithm of 2140 or something for all bitcoins to ever be created, and then there will only be 21 million of them. So it, it, it's just an experiment, and it may never catch on. But at least conceptually, you can see here is something. If people would use this as money, if people accept this as money, then uh, uh, it, it could be a very powerful challenge to gold. You know, all the gold has obviously two and a half thousand years of history. Of on this side, so it would be difficult to break into those network effects. But uh, I would argue that I think gold, for me, it would, if we leave it to the market, I think gold would win right now. But conceptually, I could see other solutions. How do you feel about the other metals? Sorry, about uh, platinum, for example, with less people holding on to it, but it's still being scarce and commoditized for? Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I don't know much about, about platinum. I have to say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert in it. I, I think, I think if you, the, I think the advantage of gold is simply that it has been used as money for such a long time, and that in, in, in all cultures around the world. I mean, if you use a gold coin now and go to many places in the Middle East, you will probably be able to trade with a gold sovereign. So for 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 the market to move over to a different kind of precious metal. With silver, it would be somewhat easier because silver has been also used as money uh, uh, for a very long time, and probably even in more countries for a long time than gold has. Um, uh, I think the problem with silver, and maybe also with platinum, is the fact that they also have uh, to a large degree industrial metals still, and, and therefore sort of the the you know sort of the, the industrial use right now uh, some of feeds back into their prices. I mean, that's a weak argument because once they become money. The industrial application doesn't matter much because then the price will be driven by the use of money. But all I'm saying is like gold is so is well established as a monetary asset, it has such a long history, and it has fewer, I believe, fewer industrial applications, which is actually an advantage because it, that's it, what I was trying to get my head around that being better that it's less use. Well, it's, it's not better, but it, 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 well, I think the, the key point here is, and that comes partially back to Noah's question, is 
Is this something specific about gold? We have to remember that once a substance is used as money, whether it's gold, silver, platinum, paper notes, or bytes on a computer hard drive, just electronic money, once this is accepted as, it is money, and it has exchange value because people accept it as money. You know, that, that is the only thing that gives it value as money. It doesn't matter if it have, has any other use or application. You see, see what I mean? Uh, obviously, there is this discussion for something to be used at the first, for the first time as money. It must obviously have had some previous value, and this is why industrial commodities have the ability to become monies. Mm -hmm. But once it's money, it's driven by its demand for money, and therefore by its exchange value that it gains as being, being, being used as money. Then the, its use as industrial commodity is, is unimportant. I just stress this because often people think with gold, they think like, well, uh, uh, sometimes people think if people argue that there should be have a gold standard, that they think is gold gives money intrinsic value, that suddenly money has, you know, the monetary asset gets some value from the industrial use of that commodity. But that's, that, that, that's meaningless, you see, because we can use electronic money today that has no, certainly no other application and no other use than just being a medium of exchange. So uh, uh, my point here is that sort of the industrial use application does not really interfere with any of these commodities as, uh, as money. But if you look at precious metals, we already have gold. So I, I don't see why, how platinum could break into and take the business away from gold. I, I, because gold is so established as a monetary asset. I, I, I just don't see how that could work. Mm. I can't exclude it, but I, I, I would find it very difficult for platinum to take that, that position away from gold. Is it uh, gold that you would advocate saving in currently then? Say again? Your savings, would you advocate saving in gold currently? Or yeah, I'm always careful to give investment advice uh, <laughs> because I did that for 20 years of my career. And uh, 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 But I can tell you, what, yeah, I, I hold most of my liquid assets are gold, physical gold. I hold physical gold as my, as my number one asset. Um, and it's simply, it's usually, I, 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 I see the point that people would say, usually the long run it should be a bet strategy to hold any kind of physical commodity because I think the whole rise of human civilization and of capitalism has been that things have constantly become cheap. You know, we learn constantly. Becoming more productive means we certainly learn with whatever the input factors are to make more of it, right? So usually, just betting on commodities, is, it shouldn't be a good play in the long run. But because of the very specific point we are at right now in our financial system, I think almost all the other assets, in particular financial assets, are hopelessly overvalued because we create these massive bubbles. And I think the risk I see is that some of these uh, these uh, uh, other assets could, you know, could, <coughs> bubbles could deflate. And also, and obviously, the, one of the key risks is also that central banks continue to print money. And if uh, we get into a fiat money crisis, people use old established forms of money, such as gold, and people will use gold as a safe haven asset. So, yeah. um, Senator Rand Paul, who ran for president of America, is uh, quite vitriolic about the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. He calls them a Ponzi scheme. And I'm just wondering, um, I've heard that who actually owns the Bank of England? And I guess that's one question. My second question is, you know how when you said the, um, the, Federal Reserve, uh, the central banks print the money? They give the money to the bank, to the banks. So what do those banks give in return? So they just get the money. Is that just free money? And, and so the, can they just take a bit of it and spend it on buying Ferraris and property and things like that? How, how, what happens to the money once it's given to them? I, I don't understand that. OK, the, uh, well, the first question, I'm, I, it's, I mean, I'm not actually quite sure the ownership structure of the uh, uh, Bank of England. Is the most well, from what I've heard, it's, it's, a, it's a privately no. owned limited company. Um, and that the directors of the company are a state secret. Well, the, I know for the Fed, because the point is often when we, the, this topic comes up, people quote this thing that the Fed is owned by the banks, and the banks own the Fed. And that is used by many people as an indication that sort of, well, this is not actually the state running the financial system, it's the banks running the financial system. I, 
I, I think that is a legalistic point. I don't think that's true. For the simple reason that the policy of the Fed is being set by politicians, is being set by Congress. When the Fed was taken off the domestic gold standard, there was a decision, as I said, the Thomas Amendment, Roosevelt. Uh, when Nixon closed the gold window, he got a couple of his advisors together in Camp David, and they decided to, to I mean, the, the, uh, Bernanke, the Fed chairman, is being appointed by Congress. I mean, this, this goes through political uh, uh, bodies. So the, the, the mandate that the Fed has, and the Bank of England is the same thing, the mandate that these central banks have, what they can do, how they can run policy, how they can run their operations, who runs them, what their objectives are, is all being set by politicians. So the, the banks, obviously the banks benefit from the, from the central banks. The banks love central banks, uh, at least uh, maybe until we're at the thick of the end game, that can kind of change because uh, what banks now realize is that obviously there cannot be uh, government supported, which there are state supported enterprises, and still keep the private profits to themselves. You know, that, that's why we have now these, that's why we de facto nationalizing the banking system, which is what we're seeing right now. Um, uh, so, so, in a way, uh, I, I can see that the banks love to have a central bank because it's a land of last resort. And uh, it's clear that once you allow your banking system to become big, you, you, you cannot allow them to go under. You know, in any capitalist industry, we should see bank or corporations that fail to close. I mean, RBS should be shut down, and Citigroup should have failed, and Northern Rock definitely should have failed. All these operate banks are still around. Why are they around? Because they now become conduits for monetary policy. You know, the, the, the state will not let its conduit for policy go. So, so, so the states, the banks have become parastable organizations. They're not, they're not really private, you know, enterprises anymore. At least the big ones. Big banks cannot go under. And uh, so, uh, how, how does the process of, of, of money creation go? Well, the, the way it operates, it, and again, there's some debate. Let me give you two ways of looking at it. Uh, what usually it would be that the central bank, if the central bank wants to increase the, the, the supply of money, that's how the theory goes. The central bank wants uh, to make sure that we have 2% inflation, so we need to make sure that uh, more money comes into the system than we gain in productivity, otherwise prices wouldn't rise. So uh, the central bank would give extra reserves to the banks. Now, they, how they do this, they buy assets from the banks. So this is the, 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 the central bank, usually government bonds. You know, the, this is the number one asset that central banks use. They can use others, and they have to use others. Uh, in the early days of the Fed, and the Fed was founded in 1913 and really started operation in 1914, the Fed would only buy uh, sort of uh, trade loans, trade paper. Uh, and in, in the early days, you know, people would have been shocked if the if the central bank would buy government bonds, because this would, would be seen correctly as funding the government. But today, most central banks use government bonds. What they do is the central bank goes out, buys government bonds from the banks, so and, 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 and credits the accounts that the banks hold at the central bank with newly printed reserves. So the, the banks have now just changed in assets, on the assets of the balance sheet, they change government bonds for reserves, but now they have extra reserves, and extra reserve means now they can expand, extend their lending business and uh, uh, create more loans. Out of nothing. Where did the banks get it? Where did the banks get the government, uh, the government assets to give to the central bank? Is that what you meant? Is that what you said? Yeah, no, but they, but they, yeah. but they have them on there. They have them from deposits. You know, for, uh, they have invested. Of all the assets, I mean, obviously banks have banks have uh, deposits on their uh, liability side and loans on the asset side, but they may not put everything into loans. They may put it into, but it could be loans. I mean, they could hand the loans over, the loans that they extended over to the central bank. But usually, most of the big banks hold tradable investment securities as well on their asset side, and those are being used for operations for the central bank. But it's a very good point because uh, it's very clear that the setup makes it interesting for the banks to own government bonds. And whenever the central bank wants to increase the money supply, the central bank will also buy government bonds. So it's clear that this entire system helps the state run large deficits. I mean, this is the reason why since 1971, since we've severed the last link to gold, almost all governments have been continuously running budget deficits, which was, would have been impossible under a gold standard. 
Because this is the, the banks have an interest to accumulate government bonds because they can hand them to the central bank and obtain reserves. And, uh, and the central bank, whenever they feel the money needs to expand, they use government bonds as, as an asset to buy and, and replace with, uh, with, uh, with new reserve money. And do the cost of those bonds go up and down then, based on, on market forces? Well, they go up on yeah, market forces, but the, the, the more involved the banks get and the central bank in, this, in the market for government bonds, the more obviously the price of government bonds will be, will be determined by those players and not other market participants. I mean, I would argue in Japan now, where the new policy is to buy more than 100% of the new issuance of the government, which means that the central bank buys all government bonds that the state issues. Um, and, and no private saver has to put up one yen to fund the government. It is done by the printing press. Yeah, that's obviously a very dangerous situation. This is official policy in Japan now. And in this market, I would argue that uh, the price of government bonds is largely manipulated by the central banks. But you know, the, the price of government bonds is very important because that is considered by most market participants as the risk-free asset. So in terms of pricing other assets, even equities or loans, things are being priced off well, the base rate, but how you fund the bank at the central bank, which is set officially by the central bank, or by the, uh, through the government yield curve, which is now manipulated by the central bankers directly. And, and even, there is, there is not even a secret. You know, the, the US Fed, uh, in their second quantitative easing operation, declared that the goal of their policy is to change the yield curve, to make sure that the yield curve has a certain shape. Um, so the central banks are now in the business of managing all these asset prices, but they are going via the banking system. The banking system is their conduit. Although I have to say that uh, now in Japan, because the banks are so highly geared, already full of government bonds, that now the central bank goes via, you know, goes you know, around the banking system and directly buys real estate loans and directly buys equities. So trying to get money, newly created money, directly into the equity market or the real estate market without using the banking system is also something I think we will see increasingly in other, in other economies and central banks. So, so that, 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 but normally, up to this crazy endpoint we now reach, the normal process would be the central bank goes up, lowers official interest rates, which already gives an encouragement to the banks to extend lending, and then they buy assets, whatever the assets are, usually government bonds, whatever the assets, assets banks hold, banks hold on the asset, asset side, buy them and replace them with reserves. And banks, are fractional reserve banks, now they have more reserves, they can conduct more lending. Some people will argue, and I often get that point because this, you know, there, there, there is a whole school of thinking that we, we always want to put the blame on the banks. You know, I, mean, I think the banks benefit from this and they've been complicit in the system, but they're not driving it. But some people argue, no, 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 the banks drive this because the banks lend money, lower their reserve ratios, and then the central bank cannot but give extra reserves to the bank to avoid the banks from being under, under, under reserved. So the banks go ahead and lend, and then turn around to the central bank and say, like, listen, we need, we need more money here, we need more bank reserves. There is some truth to that, but please remember that the central bank is still, is still the, uh, has still control over the monetary tools, and a central bank who has the guts to stand up to the banks can still you know, uh, give them clear indication that they cannot, that they should not run their reserves low. It, it, if you look back in, in, in 1979, 1980, when the US had fairly high inflation, 10, 12% consumer price inflation, Paul Volcker, um, that became the, the Fed chairman, he basically stopped the printing press. So he said, okay, he, he did not print any more money. Short rates shot up to 20%. And you, the US at the time went through the largest, the biggest recession, the, the severest recession. Uh, since uh, uh, the 1930s, uh, uh, that obviously cleansed a lot of, uh, liquidated a lot of uh, misallocations that had accumulated in the inflationary 1970s. But it's, it's very clear that you can do this. You, know, you, you can, the central bank can still hide interest rates and force banks to run high reserve ratios or liquidate, reduce their balance sheet. But usually it's not politically convenient. And I think the examples I gave in 1998 in 2002, again in 2007, these were all points when it was very clear that the banking system wanted to deleverage, and not because 
for macroeconomic reasons, simply to protect that capital, they felt overstretched. But when that happened, you know, the, 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 uh, the central bank felt like they, they, they did not want to allow this because they wanted to manage the economy. They wanted to make sure that the economy continues to grow and that banks continue to lend. So although the banks were ready to deleverage and reduce their balance sheet size, uh, the, the central bank then printed extra reserve money and encouraged the banks to, uh, to, to lend again. And this is, again, the policy we see today. So I would argue it's not driven by the banks. Yes, the banks like, the, the, like central banking. The Fed only came about 100 years ago because Wall Street wanted to have a lender of last resort. Uh, or the banks wanted to have a lender of last resort. The idea of having a government institution that is watching your back is appealing to lots of businesses and so to banks. Uh, and yes, legally, the banks even own the, uh, the central bank, but the way monetary policy is conducted is for macroeconomic policy reasons, and is determined by politicians. Yes. Um, what I'm wondering is, obviously we've come very far in this process uh, of uh, creating balances and budget deficits over the time, if we would actually adopt a fixed um, monetary system or a gold standard, would, that would probably mean adjustments. Um, adjustments that would have then come through uh, labor mobility and wage, uh, wage changes, wouldn't it? And would these changes uh, be so painful that we can't really go through it politically? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, it, it sort of yeah. reminds me of Greece. I mean, you, if you can't... It is, it's like, yes, yes absolutely. Greece is a good example, yeah. Well, isn't, isn't the euro the sort of gold standard itself? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's failing very bad. It's, well, the thing is, like, if, if it, it, it could have been a gold standard. It could have been a gold standard. But obviously, it's just another paper money system. So please remember that... Uh, I think I think there are some elements of the gold standard, obviously, in the, in the, in the, in the sense that a country that suddenly is in trouble like Greece cannot just suddenly print its own money. Uh, um, but please remember that under a gold standard, none of these economies would have been in a position to run these big deficits for a long time. You know, the only reason we had these, we had a massive housing boom in Ireland and Spain, uh, some degree in Portugal, massive current account, uh, sorry, um, current account and uh, more importantly, uh, big budget deficits, fiscal deficits in countries like Greece for such a long time is because of easy monetary policy and this monetary expansion and an assumption by the market, which is partially correct, partially incorrect, that hey, this is a paper money system, states don't go bankrupt, you know, they, they will just get easy money. And if you look back, at the obviously, since the euro started in 1999 up to the, the recent crisis, this was a period of very low interest rates globally anyway. Right? So because the Fed was very, you know, from, as I said before, 2001 to 2005, the Fed was at 1%, or 2002 to 2005, the Fed was at 1% in three years. But also remember that in 2003, uh, Germany was in very bad shape. <coughs> and and the, the, uh, not only did Germany then begin to violate the Maastricht Treaty, which it had not done so previously, uh, but the ECB, it can be argued the ECB ran a very easy monetary policy to help uh, Germany in 2003. Again, under a gold standard, that would not have happened. You know, Germany would have had to take the pain. And I can understand some of the frustration in the European periphery now, where people say, well, it was that policy that added to the real estate boom in Spain, and that allowed countries like Greece to run these budget deficits. So, uh, I think if the, if, if the Eurozone had really been conceived as a gold standard, or had been a gold standard, some of the dislocations that now haunt the system would not have been allowed to build up. And I think that is, for me, always the strongest argument for the gold standard. It's not how you deal with a crisis. It's the thing that you would not allow, and you cannot, uh, the system would not allow the build-up of these huge imbalances. Uh, the imbalances we see in all these European countries that are now in trouble, these imbalances cannot be explained in a hard money system. It, you know, a, a real estate, a dislocated real estate market, to the extent that we have it in Spain, we had it in the United States uh, in 2007, and we had it in Japan in 1989, uh, can only be explained in, a, in an elastic monetary system. 
But uh, I think there are elements of a, of a, of a, of a gold standard, obviously, now, in, in the sense that I would argue, in Europe at least, you see in some places that, yes, the market is allowed to liquidate. And in, 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 in Greece, the market is liquidating, well, obviously, Greece defaulted on some of its sovereign debt. I, I would argue it should have defaulted on more, because it still carries too much debt. A proper default, including of the assets that are held by the ECB and and by, by other international organizations should have been really better for the country. But at least we see some elements of adjustment, which obviously we, we all see is politically incredibly unpopular. What I find interesting is the hostility that I sense in the financial industry, the financial market to these measures. Whenever you know, there is an idea, recently in Cyprus, where a bank was unbound, and obviously uh, the depositors got hit, at least large depositors got hit, yeah, my sense is there's a huge outrage in the financial industry about this. How can you allow this? Which tells you how all the expectations have shifted now. We created a system in which the, the, the players in the financial market believe to have constant access to cheap money. And if there is a problem, it will be addressed by the central bank printing and lowering interest rates. So I, I think to your question, yes, I think if we, let's say there would be a global agreement to go back to a global gold standard. I think it's very unlikely to happen, but it's, it's hard to say. Uh, what would happen? Now, I think the most important thing for me is that at, at that point, at some point, interest rates would meaningfully reflect, again, the scarcity of real voluntary savings. Because we don't know, I, nobody of us can tell what the real price of these financial assets should be. What should interest rates be? We don't know. Interest rates should reflect the available pool of savings, you know, the, the time preference of the public, how many. Uh, assets can really be allocated to projects that will only give you a return in the future. This is a key question for any functioning economy. To what extent should currently available resources be allocated to meeting future needs and to which extent present needs? And for that, you need interest rates. But these interest rates, essential market prices, are being constantly distorted in our system. So what would happen is the market would set interest rates again. I would assume interest rates would be higher. I think, therefore, the price of financial assets would be lower. I think a lot of things would be liquidated. I think we would see quite a few banks go under, maybe some insurance companies, pension funds. Uh, certainly, I think a couple of sovereigns would go bankrupt, uh, such as Greece did, uh, and others as well. So yeah, it would, it would be a very, very painful adjustment process. It has been done before. Uh, for example, to, just to give you one example, the United States went on a paper standard uh, during the, the uh, Civil War in the 1860s. One of the things, I didn't really speak about the history of paper money systems. There's a chapter in the book about this. It's very interesting to see that most paper money systems came about during wars, simply because that's when the state made the money, and then when they took the currency off gold and printed money. So the US had a, 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 the greenback system in the 1860s, and obviously had inflation. And in 1879, there was a political decision to go back to gold and resume the gold standard. Very interestingly, the US went through a period of severe deflation uh, really a very sharp drop in the price level. The economy continued to grow, which is a very interesting example and, and actually quite uh, quite healthy and strong growth. And it's, it's, there is a, a reference to this in Milton Friedman's book about the monetary history of the United States, when he says, you know, this flies in the face of what most people believe today, that whenever you have deflation, you cannot have growth. Now, having said this, I would assume that if we did this today, because I think the dislocations are not much larger, that I think that the fallout would be severe. And because people fear that fallout, I do not think that politicians have the stomach to go through this. So that's why I think they will not voluntarily go back to a gold standard. Sorry, your question. Yeah, so within the Austrian school, there's the division between kind of the full reserve free banking economists and the fractional reserve free bankers. And in your discussion of deflation, the kind of account you gave of the kind of shifts in money demand was very much in line with the kind of full reserve explanation. So I think the fractional reserve Austrians are generally more kind of influenced by monetary, monetary disequilibrium theory have kind of raised two possible worries about that, both of which you sort of touched on briefly, but there's the idea of kind of price stickiness so that if you have a shift in money demand, prices won't move instantly, and though that's in the short run, you'll have kind of unemployment. And secondly, when prices do fall, they won't all fall systematically at a nice level. There will be changes in different prices relative. 
and that causes economic inefficiencies because entrepreneurs to work at an optimal level need prices to hopefully nearly reflect the relative scarcity of goods and while we're in the process of disequilibrium that's not going to happen and so you're more likely to get um, malinvestments and so the kind of this kind of solution the kind of thing like people like George Selgin have discussed is this idea of uh, fractional reserve free bank where the idea is that you have banks which will say print up kind of further print up more money in response to rises in money demand and then will retract these in cases where money demand falls so i was just wondering where you stand on this kind of if you have a position on this kind of fractional reserve full reserve free banking debate um, whether you think those kind of arguments work etc yeah, I, I try to give a short answer to this because I, you, you touch on some, 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 some interesting points. I mean, well, I, I consider myself a free banker, so I would argue I, I'm more for free banking. Uh, I think the market should decide what kind of money we use, and I think the market would decide some kind of inelastic form of money. So as long as Bitcoin is ready, I think it will be going to be gold. So let's assume we have a gold standard, a hard gold standard, and, and, and then I think we should allow Fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking will be conducted. I, uh, I think, as you know, some of the Austrian economists argue that fractional reserve banking is practically a violation of property rights, or some kind of fraud, and therefore, in a, in, a, in a proper free market economy in which property rights are rigorous, rigorously enforced, it, it wouldn't exist. I do not agree with that. I, do, I don't think there's anything fraudulent about fractional reserve banking. It, it looks a bit dodgy, but it, it's not really because I do think, at the end of the day, what people do. Well, if you put if you put your if you deposit your money into a bank, you should know that you give up ownership of the, of the money. And, and, and credit to the British legal system, the House of Lords has actually explained this 150 years ago. They made it very clear: you give, give up ownership of the money. You now have a claim against the bank, which is something different. And we know the way our monetary system works now is you you assume that that claim can immediately be turned again into money. Today, even at night, at a cash that's fine, but you also know that there could be times when that doesn't work. When the bank goes bankrupt, you know your money is in trouble. That's why people lined up out of outside of modern world. People understand this, so they do. So what I argue: if you deposit money into a bank, you know you give up money, ownership of that money. You know, you have when you hold cash, you have a form of money that is not at the same time somebody else's liability. It's just you own it. It's nobody's liability. It's just a medium of exchange. The moment you put it into a bank, it, you have the extra risk, you have the counterparty risk of the bank. So you, that, and that's where you get interest for the money, because otherwise you wouldn't get interest. So I think it's not fraudulent, it should not be banned. I think uh, would it, uh, 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 the, one of the points you raised is like, well, if we have a, 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 an inelastic monetary system for whatever reason, so let's say we have a gold standard and there's very little fractional reserve banking, money is practically inelastic. That would mean uh, you have these periods of deflation, and could that cause on the margin inefficiencies? Yes, I cannot argue against that. My point is the following. Injecting money into the economy will create larger inefficiencies. You see, what I mean? that was the point I made earlier. Money cannot be neutral. So yes, any form of money will somehow have feedback into the real economy, and some of that will be a disturbance. Neutral money is not possible. So by having any means by which you can keep, for example, try to keep the purchasing power of money stable, which I argue is impossible anyway, it's this just any attempt to do this is doomed. But uh, uh, so if, but if, if you try to do this and constantly inject money into the economy, you will create create other instabilities, and they are larger. So I think whatever slight instabilities a fixed monetary system with slight deflation would have, I think are still advantageous to having any other system. My problem with Selgin is simply that I think his assumption that fractional reserve banking meets money demand is wrong. I think it might, I think it's completely wrong. Because the fractional reserve banker does not respond to money demand. You know, if, I'm, if I want a fractional reserve bank, as a, if, if, or let's put it up differently, you have a, a growing demand for money. You don't go to a bank and take out a loan. I mean, nobody, hardly anybody does that. I mean, I cannot exclude that there is somebody in the country who does that. But because if people have a demand for money, as I said before, the first thing, if, if you want to increase your money balances, you either sell something or you reduce your money outlays with the money you spend every day. You reduce that to, to, to accumulate money balances. Very few people will go to a bank, take out a loan, pay interest to hold a higher cash balance. 
But that is the only point where you interact with a bank. A bank is not in the business of meeting money demand. A bank is in the business of meeting loan demand. So the bank deals with completely different people. The person who comes to a bank and takes out a loan doesn't have money demand. That person has demand for goods and services. In fact, that person has a very low money demand because that person is, has such a high demand for goods and services that he's even willing to pay interest to have this demand for goods and services satisfied now. That is the opposite of money demand. Money demand means low demand of goods and services, high demand of the flexibility that only money gives you. So if you look at the, the process of, to run a fractional reserve bank, you need three people. You need the depositor, who deposits the original money that becomes the reserve on which the, central bank, the, the banker then can issue more loans. You need the people who take out the loans, and you need the banker. Now, if, if the banker wants to get more money into circulation, what he has to do is to lower his reserve ratio. That means he issues more paper money or issues more deposit money on top of whatever his reserve is right now. Whether the public has a higher demand for that money or not, doesn't matter for him. Because if the, if, the, if the public has no extra demand for money, and even not extra loan demand, which is something different, well, he can lower interest rates to get the extra money into circulation. That should encourage somebody to take out a loan. But that person doesn't have money demand. Now, if the public does not have higher money demand, that money gets into circulation, People have, don't have a high demand for money. It simply means that prices will rise and the purchasing power of money will drop. If you're a money producer and a fractional reserve bank is momentarily a money producer, you can print as much money as you like. The public will take it, just as, as at higher prices, at, at higher inflation. But you know, if, if you're a money producer, the, you're, the, 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 the lack of money demand is not, no, no problem for you. It's not, it doesn't mean that any of the money you create sits in your warehouse and doesn't get into circulation. You can always get into circulation. That's the beauty. Money is the most fungible good. And you can place any amount of money because you will just allow the exchange value to adjust. So the idea is, I think that there is this idea with Sarge and also with White, Larry White, I think, the way I understand them, and I'm, I hope I'm not misrepresenting them, but the way I understand they, they have this idea that the free market fractional reserve banks will satisfy money demand. I don't know how that could work. Because you know, money demand, people, people have demand for money. They increase, they reduce outlays, money outlays on non-money goods, or they sell non-money goods for money. People don't take out loans. You know, because the, the person who takes out a loan immediately spends the money. If that person had a higher demand for money, he'd take out the loan and sit on the money, which nobody hardly anybody does. So my point here is the idea that the banks Operate fractional reserve. The, the constraining factor for the fractional reserve banker is the trust that the public has in the bank. As long as the public thinks the bank is good to go and uh, the deposit money that the bank creates is, 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 is good money to have, the, the, the bank can lower its reserve ratio and create more money. It can lower the reserve ratio, offer more loans at lower interest rates, entice loan demand, place the money in the economy. If nobody wants to have the money, that only means it loses purchasing power. And you don't care about that because you produce at zero cost. So I, I, I think I, don't, I, don't, I think there's a misunderstanding about what, how money demand interlinks with fractional reserve bank. I think we should bring the proceedings to a close, but uh, we should definitely thank Bella once again for an excellent talk and interesting discussion.